I guess we, we should probably get started. Okay. Let's see. We have less than half of the people in class. Oh, people are coming. That's good. You have the handouts for me? Oh, thanks. Yeah, or printouts. Is what is missing? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Thanks. We may not get to it, but good to have it printed. <clears throat> All right, let's get started. Seems like we should have a hard question on SIMD processing too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some of you like these hard questions. That's good. <laughs> well, nothing is hard if you know it. Right? Actually, none of these questions will be hard because once you know the concept, it's easy to answer. I'm not, I'm not going to ask you memorization questions where you you should remember what K1 exactly did. All right, let's let's get started. It's another exciting topic, vector and array processors. But before that, it's just an overview of where we are. So we've covered a lot of stuff, and now we're cover, uh, we're looking at alternative approaches to instruction level parallelism than pipelining and out of order execution. Although we can still employ these techniques on top of these alternative approaches, actually. And this is where we are within that approaches to instruction level concurrency or instruction level parallelism. Uh, we cover data flow and we're going to cover SIMD processing today. These are announcements, so hopefully you know all of these. Please compete. You'll get good extra credit. Uh, and I was really happy with the number of extra credit submissions for Lab 2, uh, which was much more than last sem previous semesters. It was seven. I think last year it was one or two. So you guys are a harder working class, which is great. <laughs> And homework three is due February 25th. You know that. I'm not going to go over this. I said before, homeworks have very little contribution to overall grade. This is not to discourage you from doing the homeworks. It's actually to, <laughs> to encourage you to do the homeworks. I would still like you to do them for your benefit. Because if you do the homeworks and if you understand everything really well, exams should be a breeze. OK, there's another thing. Uh, I want to add one more homework for you. It's homework 3.1. But it's going to be easy. It's going to be a feedback form. It's going to be due Monday, February 23rd. Basically, I'd like your feedback on the course. And I'm not sure if this is online yet. Is it online, Kevin? The feedback form? Not yet. OK, it will be online sometime today. Oh, thank you. It's easy to fill in. You can submit anonymously if you wish. But if you want to not remain anonymous, no action will be taken against you. <laughs> you can give your honest feedback. It's worth 0.25% of your grade. I guess it's an easy 0.25%. Why not do it, right? And you need to get checked off after submitting to get your grade points, basically, even if you're doing it anonymously. Well, you can email. In that case, you'll get checked off. If anonymous, show that you're turning in and have a TA check you off. OK? It's going to be, I guess, five to six pages. Just questions on what do you think about the lectures, course, homeworks. I know it's hard. You can repeat it. That's fine. That's not going to change. <laughs> OK, yeah. Oh, that's a great, good, great question. Uh, well, we can, make, we can make it extra credit, but it doesn't matter in the end, right? <laughs> we'll decide that later. 0.25%, just turned it. <laughs> should, should I do it to predicate the execution? Should I say, if you don't turn it in, you'll get a 0? <laughs> How about that? <laughs> that's a nice predication, right? Condition. Turn homework in, otherwise you'll get a zero. OK, these are the readings for today. Uh, we're not going to get to this probably, but a lot of the principles we'll cover will build up to GPUs. So let's recap of the last lecture very quickly. We talked about out of order execution as restricted data flow. We talked about a critical problem in out of order execution, which is a memory disambiguation or the unknown address problem when you have loads and stores. We talked about memory dependence handling, three different approaches, conservative, aggressive, and intelligent. Uh, we decided that intelligent is probably a good idea, except it comes with more overhead, right? Uh, and usually the answer is it depends, right? <laughs> but if you really want to get the maximum performance out of, out of order execution, you want an intelligent approach to predict the dependencies. We talked about load store queues, their design. Uh, and then we went into some design choice in an out of order processor. We very, I very quickly asked questions. For example, do you want the reservation stations distributed or unified across all of the functional units? Uh, we talked about combining out of order, superscalar, and branch prediction. 
together. We didn't go into a lot of detail on that, but this is something for you to think. And we talk about out-of-order execution and superscalar being completely orthogonal concepts. A lot of people confuse this, but don't confuse this. After taking 447, no one should confuse these two concepts. Someone says superscalar, tell them, is it out-of-order or in-order superscalar? In fact, Pentium, uh, Intel Pentium 2 was a superscalar processor that was in-order execution. It was a two-wide processor, two instructions. It could fetch, execute, decode, and execute two instructions, but it, it was all in-order execution. Intel Pentium 3, which is Pentium Pro, was an out-of-order superscalar processor, four instructions per cycle. Uh, and we uh, went over some out-of-order processor designs. And then we went into data flow at the ISA level, that approach to concurrency. We talked about its characteristics. We talked about supporting dynamic instances of a node, data flow node. And this could happen because you have loop iterations or function calls, right? And we talk about how to do that using tagging or context IDs or frames. These are the same name for different, well, same name for the same concept, a different name for the same concept. Uh, we talk about an example operation. We talk about advantages and disadvantages. And we talk about combining data flow and control flow uh, to get the best of both worlds. And this was one example, remind, uh, Intel Pentium 4 simplified to jog your memory. And this is the reading that hopefully you should have done or you're doing. This is a very good reading, by the way. This is, uh, it may be a little bit hard because there are a lot of concepts that are introduced, but at least it'll give you a very good idea of what a, what a modern out of order processor looks like circa 1995. And the papers are written in 1999. But a lot of out of order processors today are similar in terms of principles. And this was a processor that was well ahead, well, well ahead of its time, in fact, because it has this clus clustering, which you will read uh, and which we have discussed also, because you didn't. You couldn't sustain an eight-ported register file within the clock cycle time that was targeted. Uh, they they divide uh, they partition they duplicated the register file such that you had two copies of each register and you had four ports in each. So you remember that. So very brief review: data flow. The key benefit you can get irregular parallelism very very well. You can exploit that very very well. And this is perhaps the best known approach for exploiting irregular parallelism. Irregular meaning. It's all over the place, right? Dependencies are all over the place. We'll contrast this with regular parallelism today. And only real dependencies constrain processing. The huge disadvantage is debugging is extremely difficult, right? With a data flow uh, ISA, because you don't really have a precise state. You cannot draw that precise state anywhere because it's really data-driven execution. And execution is really dependent on the availability of the data, which may change across executions. And there's a lot of parallelism which makes debugging even harder, right? If you had only one instruction executing at a time, maybe precise state does, may not matter that much, right? Because that's precise state at that point. But if you have thousands of instructions in flight, then there might be a problem. Okay, and then this was another slide. I colored it a little bit. Can we get the best of both worlds? That was the question we asked. Uh, model one, which has been very successful, keep control flow at the ISA level to keep programmers sane, such that you can have this precise state. Uh, but do data flow underneath to get parallelism uh, while preserving sequential semantics. And this has been extremely successful. And we talked about another model, which is very interesting too. Keep the data flow model at the high level, but incorporate, incorporate some control flow at the ISA level, such that you have some threads that are triggered by the availability of the data. This is still hard to debug, but it, uh, it overcomes some of the disadvantages of the data flow processing. And this was a summary. Uh, basically, at the ISA level, data flow has not been as successful. There have been computers that are built, but they're not used. Many of you don't use data flow ISAs, right? Or maybe you don't know. Hopefully you know <laughs> at, this point, at this time in this course. But data flow implementations under the hood have been extremely successful. In fact, probably all of the processors that you're using are uh, out-of-order execution processors. Okay, so that's a very quick summary of where we are now. Now we'll go into a very different approach to parallelism, which is exploiting regular parallelism. And that's uh, SIMD processing. Actually, there are several regular parallelism approaches we will see. SIMD processing is one of the most successful of them. But before we go into it, I'll introduce Flynn's taxonomy of computers. Mike Flynn, in this paper when he wrote, uh, that, that he wrote in 1966, he categorized computers into four different types, depending on uh, how many instructions operate on how many pieces of data? And single instruction, single data means 
uh, you have instructions, a single opt instruction. So you can divide the computing. Well, I guess this doesn't work. If I you can divide the computing space based on no. Where's the rotate? Okay. This is a hard programming interface. <laughs> Uh, based on what an instruction does, how many of them operate on how many pieces of data. Is the instruction, uh, you can have single instruction executing at a time or multiple instructions operating on a single piece of data or multiple pieces of data. I guess instruction here. Single instruction, single data, that's what we've been looking at so far, right? Single instruction operates on a single data element. If you look at MIPS, you really have a single data element. Well, you have two operands, but the, they, they refer to the scalar data elements, right? It registers a scalar value. And we looked at many ways of extracting parallelism out of the single instruction, single data model. Pipelining, instructions, doing out of order execution. We'll talk about single instruction operating on multiple data elements today, which is over here. Yeah, the single instruction operating on multiple data elements. So this is going to be vector or array processors. Basically, when you think about instruction, think about an operation, an add operation happening on a thousand different data elements. Basically, a, thousand diff a single instruction specifying a thousand different operations on different data elements. That's the idea of single instruction multiple data. And this is powerful. This, may, this makes sense if, you have, if you're repeating the same operation on many, many data elements, right? Think about a vector add. You're adding two vectors. Each of them has a, a length of a thousand elements. Basically, you're doing really a thousand ads. And you don't really need to specify that using a SysD model, single instruction, single data model. If your registers are scalar, yes, you do need to do it. Basically, you need to go through the entire array with a for loop, as you do in C. You do a for, uh, for each element, you add, uh, add the vectors and store the result in some other vect uh, element, a vector element. That's single instruction, single data model. But you could do the same thing by having a single instruction that says do a thousand ads, right? And store the results into respective elements of this vector. That's the idea of single instruction, multiple data. There are other models, multiple instructions operating on a single element. This is kind of weird, actually. Uh, basically, uh, you have, let's say, maybe add, multiply, divide, and they're all operating on a single element. How, how does that work? It's a little bit hard to imagine. But the closest form is really what we will discuss, which is the systolic array. I'll briefly give you the idea. Uh, basically, you have this adder, maybe multiplier, and then divider. And then assume that you have inputs coming into the adder, multiplier, divider, and these are all fixed. Basically, ad uh, adder does the operation. This is one instruction. Transforms the data into something else. Then the multiply does the operation, and then divide does the operation. Basically, multiple instructions operating on, you can think of this as a single data element that are the inputs if you think about it as kind of the black box right, with the instructions. This is instruction one, instruction two, instruction three, and this is data. And we will see that. That was actually, that concept was developed at CMU in the 1980s, or at late 1970s, actually. And the last one is multiple instructions operating on multiple data. Basically, I guess this part. Basically, you have multiple instruction streams in this case. Well, today's multiple processors or multi-threaded processors operating on different instruction streams are the best example. And we will see all kinds of processors in this course. So far, we've been looking at SysD. Now we'll look at SIMD. Okay. Well, let's take a look at it. Basically, SIMD uh, processors exploit data parallelism. Concurrency or parallelism arises from performing the same operation on different pieces of data. It's pretty simple and beautiful. In fact, these are some of the most beautiful processors that are designed, and that work really well. GPUs. Uh, for example, dot product of two vectors. For example, the addition of two vectors, right? Multiplication of two matrices. Contrast this with data flow. In data flow, concurrency really arises from executing different operations in parallel in a data-driven manner. Single operations. Nodes, remember nodes actually well, nodes can specify anything, actually, but uh, at the basic level, nodes are actually a single instruction, single data element. And you're really uh, exploiting concurrency 
based on the independence of these different nodes. But you're not really exploiting concurrency, at least not explicitly, uh, from uh, doing the same operations on different pieces of data. And contrast this with thread or control parallelism. Basically, in a thread parallelism or a MIMD machine, multiple instruction, multiple data machine, concurrency really arises from executing different threads of control in parallel. How many of you have done multi-thread programming? That's good. Everybody. In 213? Yeah? No. Which class? 213. Okay, that's good. How many of you have taken operating system course? No? A 410? Okay. You liked it? <laughs> Tell me after this class if this is harder or that is harder. <laughs> <laughs> but an operating system course is a great course to take, actually, after or before computer architecture. That will, that will give you the system skills with computer architecture to actually be very successful going forward. But if you've done operating systems, you've done a lot of control, uh, parallelism, right? Thread level parallelism. But basically, in thread level parallelism, concurrency arises from executing different con uh, threads of uh, control uh, in parallel. And this is very different from uh, same, uh, doing the same operation on different pieces of data. Although, keep this in mind, we'll come back to GPUs later. What GPUs will do is they will actually have threads. You can program GPUs using threads, but those threads uh, are grouped into what are called warps that execute the same operation on multiple pieces of data. Basically, threads are actually doing exactly the same thing but doing it on different pieces of data. So you can combine these two different models. And G that's what exactly GPUs do, even though at the heart they're SIMD engines. And we will see that after uh, this class. So SIMD really exploits instruction level parallelism, right? You're really, or operation level parallelism. Multiple instructions, or more op appropriately operations, are concurrent. They're just operating on different pieces of data. Right? Actually, it's really the same instruction. <laughs> but leads to multiple operations. So if, if someone asks you what kind of parallelism SIMD exploits, it's really instruction level parallelism. It's a different approach to execute concurrent instructions in parallel, except you're merging those concurrent instructions together because they're operating on different pieces of data. And this actually enables a lot of benefits. Uh, we'll see actually in a, in a code example soon uh, that you can reduce the number of instructions you fetch, right? If you're adding, if you're doing a thousand ads, if they're operating on different data elements, in a SISD machine, single instruction, single data machine, you're fetching a thousand of these ads, 1,000 ads, right? Fetching, decoding, executing. Well, in a SIMD machine, you fetch one ad, decode one ad, and execute a thousand operations based on that ad. So your control overhead is very low. You're really uh, using most of your energy, if you will, on data which is the real operations instead of fetching and decoding the instructions. And we will see that. That's one of the reasons why GPUs are very, very efficient, uh, well, energy efficient in terms of the uh, amount of work they do, because they're really fetching one instruction and uh, generating lots of work based on that instruction. OK, we, I already said this. But this could actually happen in time and space. So we'll introduce the time and space duality here. You have to have multiple processing elements. There is no question about that. In, for out-of-order execution, actually, you have to have multiple processing elements, right? <laughs> in fact, the out-of-order execution when it was introduced, the title of the paper is An Efficient Algorithm for Exploiting Multiple Functional Units. Uh, so let's take a look at the time-space duality. Uh, an array processor, this is a purist's distinction. Today, most of the processors are a combination of both. We will get to that. But an array processor, execu uh, an instruction operates on multiple data elements at the same time using different space as using different functional units. But you can do this in time also. A vector processor, an instruction operates on multiple data elements in consecutive time space, uh, consecutive time steps using the same space or same functional unit. They're both SIMD machines, except they're doing it differently. And here's an example over here. This is the array processor. You have processing elements. You have four processing elements that can do any operation. Vector processor, you have four processing elements that can do load, add, multiply, and store. And this is our instruction stream. This is kind of a simple vector code. Uh, and we'll look at the registers later, but think about this. Basically, you're loading from memory address A into a vector register that can store four elements. You can think of this as an array of four elements. Uh, and then you're adding one to each element. That's what this instruction is doing adding one to the vector register, basically incrementing each element. 
and then you're multiplying each element by 2, and then you're storing the vector register back into the array in memory. That's what this does. So in an array processor, each operation executes in parallel. Remember here, instruction operates on multiple data elements at the same time using different functional units. Each load operation specified by this instruction happens in parallel in different execution units. So you do all of the loads, four loads for each element, for first element, second element, third, uh, third element, fourth element. And then you do the adds, and then you do the multiplies, and then you do the stores. In a vector processor, you do the load of the first element of the array in the first cycle. In the next cycle, you do the load of the second element, but now you can start the add of the first element. In the next cycle, you do the load of the second element. You can start the add of the first, uh, second uh, load of the third element, add of the second element, and multiply of the first element. And then you can start the load of the third element in the fourth cycle, I guess fourth element. I should have changed these numbers. But load, load, load of element uh, three, and then add of element two, multiply of element one, store of element zero. Basically, what we're doing is we're, what we've pipelined the load across time units, right? Or pipelined each operation across time units. In an array processor, you're executing the same operation at the same time. In a vector processor, you're executing different operations at the same time. But if you look at the space, for the same space, in an array processor, you're executing different operations at the same space. For the vector processor, you're doing the same operation at the same space. So which one is more hardware efficient? Vector, I heard. Yes, that's correct, right? If you look at the vector processor, you can actually have one functional unit for add, one functional unit for load, one functional unit for multiply, dot, dot, dot. Whereas the array processor, you need to sustain multiple instructions of the same type across different functional units. So each functional unit needs to be kind of general purpose, if you will. They need to do lots of things. That's why vector processors were developed first, if you will. Uh, uh, they were very cost efficient. Right? Cray-1 is a vector processor, for example, one of the earliest supercomputers that was really successful. OK. So keep this in mind. This is a purest distinction. We're going to combine these. You can actually do load 0, load 1, load 2, load 3, and then assume that you have eight elements, load 4, load 5, load 6, load 7, right? You can actually not only do in space, but also in time. You can, uh, that, that way you get even more parallelism. And modern GPUs do that. OK. Uh, let's take a, uh, I'd like to contrast SIMD array processing with VLIW. Remember, we talked about VLIW, but we never uh, exactly pinpointed what it is. Well, this is a pictorial way of pinpointing what it is. Basically, compiler specifies multiple independent operations that can be executed, that can be patched and executed in parallel. This is one example. At this program counter, compile, compiler had bu has bundled four different instructions, and these can be fetched and executed in parallel. Compiler ensures that they're independent. Contrast this with superscalar execution. Superscalar execution, hardware finds, uh, hardware fetches n instructions per cycle and figures out the dependencies. Here, the compiler tells you, oh, I have n instructions, n operations for you bundled into this very long instruction word. You can fetch and execute them without checking for dependencies. This is what a VLIW engine looks like. And we'll get back to VLIW in the next lecture, actually. Basically, you, with the same program counter, you access the program counter and you fetch this very long instruction word. Each operation in the instruction word specifies an independent operation, and you can move those directly into the functional units without checking for dependencies. Make sense? It's nice because you can have independent operations here. The difference with SIMD is SIMD is not as flexible. Basically, a program counter cannot specify multiple instructions. It still specifies multiple operations. But it looks like this, basically a single operation, add, but on multiple different data elements. Basically, an you, you fetch an instruction, which basically operates on multiple different data elements of the same vector register. This is the add that we've shown earlier, right? This is the increment of the vector register. What you're doing is incrementing each element of the vector register, which means that you're, again, this points to your instruction being very powerful, right? This add really specifies four things that you can do in parallel. It works nicely if your code is like this, of course, right? If, if your code is such that you're doing multiple instances of the same operation on different data elements, it works great. And graphics is a very good example of this. If you're operating on pixels, 
and I will show you, hopefully at the end of this lecture, an example of operating on pixels. If you're doing the same operation on all parts of the image, and the image has a million pixels, well, that's great, right? OK. So what is a vector? I assume you all know what a vector is, hopefully. It's basic math. It's a one-dimensional array of numbers, right? And many scientific and commercial programs actually use vectors. And we're going to use this as a running example over here. Basically, what we're doing here is, I guess we're averaging two vectors and storing the result in another vector. Uh, and each vector has 50 elements here. And a vector processor is one whose instructions operate on vectors rather than scalar or single data values. I'm going to use the vector processor as an example, but keep in mind array processor is just a dual of this. Right. So basic requirements. How, what, what do we need from a processor to be able to do this? Right. We want to operate on vectors rather than scalar values, which means that we need to be able to access the vectors. Right. We need to be able to load or store vectors or operate them in memory. Right. Let's assume that we have a register architecture, load store architecture, instead of memory to memory only architecture. So we need to have ability to load and store vectors, which means that we need to have vector registers. So your registers are not scalar anymore. They're really vectors. OK, simple, hopefully. We need to operate on vectors of different lengths if you want some programmability out of this, right? Which means that you need to be able to specify how long your vector is. In this case, you should be able to specify it's 50 entries long, right? If it's a, uh, if, uh, if it's, if you're operating on short vectors, four, then you should be able to change that. So you need to have a vector length register that's programmable, right? Because sometimes you would be adding eight entries together. Sometimes you'd be adding four, maybe, right? Depending on the sizes of your vectors. Okay? And elements of a vector might be stored apart from each other in memory, which means that you need to have a way of loading that vector from memory in a regular way. And we will see that uh, soon, why they might be stored far away from each other, right? Let's say you're storing a matrix. How do you store a matrix? Well, you have rows and columns. Let's actually write this down, and we'll get back to this. So assume that uh, this is your matrix, a two-dimensional array. You have, I don't know, maybe 16 columns and 16 rows. Uh, and let's say these are your rows. Let's assume that you store this matrix in row major order, which means that a row is in consecutive locations in memory. Right? You've heard about the row major order? And probably 213 again, you did this, right? Consecutive elements in a row are in consecutive locations in memory. In this case, uh, this is at address 0, this is at address 1, address 2, dot, 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 address 15. And the, first element of the second row is an address 16, dot, 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 and this at address 31. This at address 17, and this at address, I should be able to calculate this right, <laughs> 47, I guess, right? Oh, wait. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, say it again? Not 17. You're right. You're right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Makes no sense. <laughs> you cannot have that. You cannot mix row major and column major. I guess you could, but you would... It wouldn't be good. Okay, anyway, dot, dot, dot. Basically, in this case, the consecutive elements of a row are in consecutive locations in memory. So if you're loading this entire row from memory, if you want to load this entire row, your stride is really one, right? The distance between consecutive elements is one. But what if you want to load the column? In that case, your stride is 16, right? And sometimes you may want to load the row, and sometimes you may want to load the column, depending on what operation you're going to do on this matrix. That's why you need a vector stride register, I'll call this VSTR, that is programmable. Okay? And we will uh, look at that. And stride is basically the distance, of, distance between two elements of a vector. And the good thing is, as long as the elements are uh, have the same distance, this is very regular, right? You can actually load consecutive addresses or load addresses that are predictable, right? You always add the vector stride register to the base address that you're loading from. And your base address can change depending on where you are, which column you're loading. Okay? Okay. We're going to get back to this. 
Uh, a vector instruction performs an operation on each element in consecutive cycles. This is a vector processor, not an array processor. And vector function units are pipelined. Each pipeline stage operates on a different data element. It's can because data elements are independent, right? That's the beauty of this. Because data elements are independent, vector instructions are actually a lot deeper pipelines. There are no intra-vector dependencies. Basically, if you're adding, if you go back to this code over here, here, a0 plus b0 divided by 2, that's the first element. a1 plus b1 divided by 2, that's the second element. a2 plus b2 divided by 2, that's the third operation. Basically, there's no dependencies, uh, there's no dependency between any of these operations. As a result, they can all go through the adder, and you can have a very heavily pipelined adder, right? Okay. There's no control flow within a vector. It's basically a vector add, vector multiply, right? And you have a known stride, as we just discussed. Uh, assuming you have uh, your vector, uh, your elements are actually in consecutive, uh, in locations that are uh, separated by stride, you have a known stride. And this allows prefetching of vectors into registers, cache, memory, wherever in the memory system. It's very powerful. Let's take a look at the advanced and disadvantages before we go through some uh, code examples. Now you know the high-level concept, right? The key advantage is, because you have no dependencies within a vector, you can actually do very deep pipelining. You can actually do very good parallelization. And GPUs exploit this nicely, too. The second, I guess which one is more important, depends on your taste. Each instruction generates a lot of work. You don't need to fetch and decode a thousand different instructions for doing the same operation on multiple pieces of data. So this actually incre increases your energy efficiency and instruction fetch bandwidth requirements also. Because you have a highly regular memory access pattern, you can actually interleave vector data elements across multiple memory banks to get higher memory bandwidth. And we will see this. The reason uh, High bandwidth memories were developed. Multiple banks were developed was actually because of vector processors, such that you can sustain uh, the loading of so many elements from memory. Right. Very, very briefly, I guess. Assume that you're loading elements zero through fifteen. Assume you have sixteen banks in memory. Element zero is here. Oh, you can. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this should be automatic, also, right? <laughs> Okay, this is bank 0, bank 1, bank 2, dot, 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 bank 15. Assume that you've interleaved your elements. Element 0 is here, 1 is here, 2 is here, dot, 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 15 is here. Now you can actually start one operation per cycle, and all of those operations can proceed in parallel, and you can get one element per cycle from the memory system. Okay, and we will see that. We'll, we'll get to it quickly. So prefetching a vector is also relatively easy because you basically add the uh, stride to the previous address you've generated. You have the base address, stride. You can keep actually adding the stride to the previous address that you generate to generate the uh, addresses of each element. And finally, no, there's no need to explicitly code loops, right? You have fewer branches in the instruction sequence. Here, for example, and we will see this a lot more clearly if you go back to this example over here, this loop kind of goes away. If you have a vector, uh, if you have a vector length of 50, and if you say vector add register one and register two, assuming register one, uh, vector register one and vector register two contain a and b, if you loaded them before, there's no loop anymore. There's no branch. Yes. What if you say you just need a base address and then you keep adding to it? Right? So what if you have like uh, data elements in different places? We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Yes, you need to support that to be programmable. Okay. Good question. OK, so you, you can eliminate branches. Branches, remember, were causing a lot of problems to us. Now they're gone. Well, I guess I should have asked you the disadvantage before putting it up. <laughs> but there's a huge disadvantage to this also. Like every idea, does it work? The, qu the answer to the question, does it work? You know the answer. It depends, right? <laughs> and this depends heavily on uh, what kind of parallelism you have in your program. Basically works if parallelism is regular, if you have this kind of parallelism, or data or SIMD parallelism, what people call, or vector-like operations in your program. It works very well. But if your parallelism is irregular, if you cannot figure out these operations where you operate on multiple uh, piece, uh, uh, data elements and you're doing the same instruction or same operation, 
If you cannot figure that out, it's not going to work, right? You can design all the hardware you need, and you're eventually going to operate on scalar values. So it becomes very inefficient, right? For example, if you're searching for a key in a linked list, well, really, you're not operating on an array in that case, right? The next thing that you're looking for is dependent on the previous thing, which means that you cannot parallelize them. Right? Even though you may be doing exactly the same operations on the different part elements of the linked list. Right? You may be doing the search for a key in the linked list. Basically, you're loading the key. You're comparing the key to some value and maybe doing something if they match, right? You're, you're doing exactly the same thing on many different elements of the linked list, but you have a dependency between the elements. That may be difficult. So maybe linked lists are not the best structures for this. OK. This is a quote, actually, uh, from a paper that I'm going to recommend you uh, to read. This is the paper that introduced a very long instruction word architecture, VLIW. Uh, Josh Fisher in that paper says, to program a vector machine, the compiler or hand coder must make the data structures in the code fit nearly exactly uh, the regular structure built into the hardware, which is what we've seen, right? Uh, multiple operations, um, uh, multiple data elements operate on by a single instruction. That's hard to do in the first place and just as hard to change. One tweak and the low-level code has to be rewritten by a very smart and dedicated programmer who knows the hardware and often the subtleties of the application area. And GPUs are actually kind of like that, except they've alleviated some of these concerns, as we will see. Basically, for example, I'll give you one example. What if you have 16 banks here? Oh, Man, this should really be automatic. <laughs> what if you have 16 banks here, and you're doing a vector load, and your stride, in this case, is 16, and your data is laid out this way? Well, you're always hitting this bank, right? Because what you're doing is you're starting, uh, let's say your base address is zero, you're loading element zero first uh, in, in a vector uh, vector instruction, vector load. What you want to load is element zero uh, or uh, element at address zero. The first element is at address zero, the second element is at address 16, the, the third element is at address 32, uh, 48, 64, dot, 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 right? And they all happen to be in the same bank. Which means that if you want to take advantage of this machine, you'd better somehow lay out your data nicely, such that you can load one element per cycle from different banks. So, which means that a vector load should really, different elements of the vector load should really go to different banks. And this may depend on your machine organization, right? Your machine may put, I don't know, maybe zero and one here, and two and three here, multiple different addresses in the same bank, right? Well, if your machine changes, now your code needs to change also, right? If you want to get the maximum performance. That's what he's referring to over here. And this is just one example. What if your vector uh, size changes? What, is your, uh, what, what if uh, the number of lanes, lane is how many functional units you have, changes across generations? Well, if you want to take advantage of the machine, you may want to increase, you may want to change your code, right? Okay. And the second thing, memory bandwidth, this is a limitation, actually. It's not necessarily a disadvantage. But memory bandwidth can easily become a bottleneck, especially if you have huge data to adopt, operate on. If your compute to memory operation balance is not maintained, and if your data is not mapped appropriately to memory banks. This is the example that we've discussed uh, earlier. What is compute to memory operation? Basically, you're doing some computation. Uh, you're doing very little computation, but you need to load a lot of data, right? Then you're limited by the memory bandwidth. We may get back to this. Okay, any questions? So this is the high level advantages and disadvantages and limitations. Now let's go into a little bit more depth uh, as to how this works. So basically, I told you about vector registers. You need to have data structures that you need to operate on using single instruction, multiple data instructions, a SIMD instructions. You need to have vector, vector registers. This is a vector data register. It holds n bit values, and it, it can contain n elements. When you're designing a vector processor, that n is important, right? How many elements you can have, because that really determines how large uh, of a vector uh, your, how many data elements 
that your instruction can operate on, right? If this is, if n is 1, that's a scalar processor, right? You're operating on one data element. If n is 64, which is what K1 had, now you can operate on 64 uh, wide vectors. And, well, I shouldn't call it wide vectors because width in this case is the value, width of the value. 64 element vectors. Although you will see people calling n wide vectors also. That basically refers to the elements. Uh, you, you need to have vector control registers. We talked about vector length. Basically, even though you may have 64 elements here, you may not always want to operate on 64 elements, right? Sometimes you may want to operate on 16 because your vectors are that long in the program. So you need to be able to change that vector length. You need to be able to change vector stride as we just discussed. And uh, maximum vector length, uh, and then we need a vector mask. We'll talk about this. Maximum vector length can be n. This is the vector, the maximum number of elements stored in a vector register. If you need to operate on larger vectors, you chop it up into, you divide into uh, uh, these, uh, divide, it, uh, divide things such that it fits into the vector registers, and we will see that. Basically, now you need a loop. Okay, a vector mask register, basically you may not always want to do the add on all elements of a vector. What if you're doing conditional execution, for example? Based on some condition, you do the add. Based on, and if the condition doesn't hold, you don't do the add. That's where the vector mask register comes in. It indicates which elements of the vector uh, the instruction should take effect on. And you can uh, you can set the vector mask using test instruction. Basically, these are compares, right? For example, if you're if you if if uh, if the element is equal to zero, you can set the vector mask as one. Otherwise, it will be zero. And the operation that's coming next, if it's a masked operation, it will basically take, into, uh, take effect only on those elements that do not satisfy the condition, or that satisfy the condition, right? You can think of it as predicate execution, right? Predic basically, you're setting a predicate bit associated with each element telling whether the instruction should take effect on this element. Right. We'll get to this also. OK, let's take a look at the vector function. Here. Once you have registers, and registers are basically, this is your data type in a vector processor, right? You have a vector data, data type, not, as, not only scalars. You need functional units. And as I said, you can use a deep pipeline to execute uh, each operation on an element. Right? As a result, you can get a fast clock cycle. So if you look at this, these are your vector register, vector register one, vector register two, and where the result goes into vector register three, it looks kind of beautiful. Basically, every cycle, you take one element, if you're, if you're doing an add, I guess it's the multiply in this case, if you're doing a multiply, if every cycle, you take one element from the source registers and send it to the pipeline. And you don't need to check for dependencies. In the next cycle, you take the next element. In the next cycle, you take the next element. And once the result becomes available, you put it into the appropriate place in the destination vector. Right? This is one of the reasons some people call this kind of streaming, right? Basically, what you're doing is you're really streaming input vectors into the function. It has streaming the results out into vector registers. So if you hear stream processors, it's kind of like this. Some, some people call GPUs as, well, actually, NVIDIA calls uh, its GPU core as a streaming multiprocessor. Well, that's kind of a fancy name for a functional unit that can stream data from vector registers and that can stream data into the destination vector registers. And you have multiple functional units. That's why it's a most streaming multiprocessor, SM. OK? Uh, the control of this deep pipeline, and this can be really, really deep, right? This could be actually a 1,000 deep. And you can make it very high clock cycle. You don't need to check for dependencies again. Uh, it's simple because elements in the vector are independent. If that's violated, well, that's not violated if you're doing multiple operations on uh, uh, the same operation on multiple pieces of data, then uh, you cannot do this. But th uh, that's the beauty of vector processing. This is one example of a vector machine. This Cray 1, basically, just to give you, it had basically eight 64 element vector registers over here. And it had the vector units. You can see add, logical, shift and some floating point vector units also. Uh, and it had 64 bits per element. And it also had a scalar unit. And we will get back to this, because scalar operations were actually really important. 
and we will see the bottleneck in these machines. In the end, scalar part of your machine bottlenecks uh, forms your bottleneck because you may not be able to vectorize your code, right? Not all of your operations in a program may be vectorizable, and we'll get to that. It had 16 memory banks. It had 16 memory banks because each memory bank access latency was 11 cycles, and they wanted to be able to get one element per cycle. Right? If you want to get one element per cycle from a bank, you'd better have, and if your bank latency is 11 cycles, you'd better have more than 11 banks, or at least 11 banks. But having 11 banks in a binary machine is a little bit difficult. How do you address those banks? That's why they had 16 banks. And these are the other things that it had. You can take a look at this paper. Let's take a look at these memory banks. Basically, if you want to load and store vectors from, uh, well, load from memory or store to memory, and if you want to operate on vectors, you need to really load or store multiple elements, right? You're not getting a single scalar value. And we've already discussed that elements are separated from each other by a constant distance. Let's assume this for now. And also assume that stride is equal to one for now. That's kind of beautiful. If this is the case, elements can be loaded in consecutive cycles if we can start the load of one element per cycle. Actually, you don't need to assume stride equal one for now, right? To, for this to be true. If this is true, you can sustain a throughput, memory throughput of one element per cycle. And that's what you would like to do in a vector processor, right? You get one element per cycle and you send it to the functional unit. How do you achieve this with a memory that takes more than one cycle to access? And the answer is you bank the memory. If you have a single monolithic structure, this time I remembered it before you shout. That's good. If you have a single monolithic structure, it's certainly not possible to do this, right? Well, I guess it is possible to do this. You need to multiport it. But that's kind of expensive. And we will see some of those later on. Basically, you bank it. Instead of having a single monolithic structure, monolithic memory, you chop it into pieces. You have 16 of them. And you can start one, ac uh, accessing one of them every cycle. That's the idea of banked or interleaved memory. Memory is divided into banks that can be accessed independently. And we're going to assume that banks share an address and data buses to minimize ping costs. So you, this is kind of what uh, things look like. This is a CPU. It's a vector processor, let's say. You have address bus, data bus, and control bus that are shared across the banks. Because they're shared, you can only start one access in one bank in a given cycle. Right? And the reason they're shared is because, I mean, this is not this is a design choice. You can actually have multiple data buses that make these banks completely independent. If you do that now, what you need is more pins, certainly. Uh, if, you have, uh, if you have banks like this, you can now start and complete one access, one bank access per cycle, and you can sustain n parallel accesses if all n go to different banks. And this is really important, if all n go to different banks. That's the difficulty of actually dealing with vector machines and GPUs today. So what does a vector memory system look like? Basically, remember, we have a base address and a stride. And these are 16 banks that you have, just like uh, K1. You just need an address generator. You start with a base address, vector load or vector store. Let's look at a vector load. It sends a base address and sends a stride from the stride register to the memory system. And the memory system now automatically start from the base first, load the base, and then add stride to the base and uh, start the next access in the next cycle. And then change this register over here. Uh, and then start the next access in the next cycle, next access in the next cycle, dot, 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 right? And next address is simply computed as previous address plus the stride, where the initial previous address is the base. You start with the base. If stride is equal to 1 and consecutive elements are interleaved across the banks, you have uh, element 0, element 1, element 2, dot, 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 here, and the number of banks is greater than or equal to bank latency, then you can sustain one element per cycle throughput, right? So all these need to be through. Now, if your stride is equal to not one, then you can still sustain one element per cycle throughput. But there needs to be a condition that's true. Can anyone guess what that is? You shouldn't have bank conflicts, meaning whenever you're loading a vector, two elements that you need to load should not go to the same bank. Right? Should not be in the same bank. Okay, we'll get back to this. 
You can still do it if your stride is not one. Okay, let's take a look at an example. Let's, take, let's see the power of this with a simple code example. And this is the same code example that I showed you over here. We're averaging two vectors. Uh, and we have 50 elements uh, in this. This is the scalar code. So if you want to write some scalar code with some cooked up ISA over here, this is what it would look like. These are the instructions, each instruction, and its latency over here. These are the latencies, actually. They're derived from K1. K1 had actually 11 cycle latency. Basically, you need to move the loop index into register 0. You need to move the addresses, beginning addresses of the arrays into different registers. And then you start the loop. Basically, each loop iteration loads one element of uh, array A into R4. In the next element, uh, the, 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 the one element of array B into R5. And then you add them. And then you do the shift, divide by 2. And then you store the result into uh, the uh, into memory uh, in I guess starting from address C, and then you check the whether or not you're done. You check the loop index uh, and decrement it, and then loop back if you're not done. This is basically scalar code. You can write this really easily today, right? Hopefully, and we we use auto increment addressing to fit this in the slide. If you don't have auto-increment addressing, actually, this will be longer code, right? You need to do the address calculation. But basically, once you do the load over here, you increment R1. That's the beauty of auto-increment addressing here. And remember, when we talk about auto-increment addressing, it works really nice for arrays. And exactly, you can see, it works really nicely here. So if you do this calculation, it's actually 304 dynamic instructions. You have 50 times 6 here, 300, and then the header here, 304. It's a lot. And we'll look at, basically, you're going to decode this many instructions, fetch and decode. Let's take a look at how long it will take, assuming these latencies. This is the latency of an add. Uh, maybe I have this here. That's good. Assuming these latencies, let's, let's take a look at the scalar execution time on an in-order processor with one bank. I guess you can see it. That's good. And I'm not going to go through this in detail, actually. But in, in such a processor, assume it's in order. And if you look here, instruction, well, I guess we don't need to look here. Now we can look here. Instructions are all dependent on each other, right? All of these, they're, they're all dependencies. And assume no forwarding, dot, dot, dot. Uh, it takes 200, 2,004 cycles, basically. Basically, each loop iteration takes 40 cycles. 33, 30, is that correct? Oh, this is a vector code. Wow, I already cheated. Do we have the scalar code? Or maybe I didn't ask you to print it. OK, that's the vector code. All right, look at the scalar code. <laughs> each operation takes 40. Each uh, looped, uh, loop iteration takes 40 uh, cycles. And you have uh, 50 of these loop iterations. And then you have four more, instruct four more cycles over here. 2,004 cycles. OK, that's in order processing with one bank. Because you have one bank, you cannot, even though these two are independent, if you look at these, these two are independent, right? They're not accessing the same memory location as long as you can determine that. Uh, because you have one bank, you cannot actually start them uh, in parallel. But if you have 16 banks, you can reduce the execution time of this in-order processor. Basically, you can pipeline the first two loads, and you can actually reduce the execution time significantly. The first load can start, and the next load can start. But then everything is dependent. So you cannot actually go to the next part because it's in order. So basically, you can reduce the uh, execution time of a loop iteration to 30 cycles because this one takes one cycle now. And this one takes, I guess, 11 cycles, right? 11, 15, yeah. OK, does that make sense? You're really pipelining these two. Both of them com uh, complete in 12 cycles total. OK. And as a result, you get 1504 cycles. So just by banking an in-order processor, you can significantly improve performance, right? That's 25% right there. That's the benefit of banking without even doing vector execution. Now we're going to look at vector execution soon. I think I've already told you why 11 banks, so we're going to get back to that. So the, if you, uh, the realization is that this loop is actually vectorizable. Right? This loop, uh, each iteration of the loop is independent of any other iteration. 
And that's what vectorizable or fully vectorizable means, or fully parallelizable. You can execute all of these iterations in parallel, if you will. In fact, you can execute these different iterations in different processors if you have a mul multiple processors. Right? Think about that for now. But we're going to use it, uh, execute as a vector processor to be simple. And this is the vectorized loop. This is the vector code. And now I can bring in my picture here. It's the same thing over here, except one is tilted. OK, I'll use this in a little bit. Basically, you need to do the uh, set the vector length register. And the length is 50 here. Vector stride is 1, because we're loading consecutive elements. Uh, and then the first operation is a vector load from address A into vector register 0, which basically loads 50 elements. And it takes 11 cycles to get the first element. And then after that, you get one cycle per uh, one element per cycle, right? Because we have we're assuming that we have 16 banks right now. Yes. Um, is VLN the same as VBank? Yes, that's right. VLN. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. Why is it VLN? You get extra credit because you recognize it for. <laughs> Record that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's a good point. I don't know why it's VLN. <laughs> All right. But it's the same as VLAN, VLAN. Uh, the second vector load, the same thing. You load B into the vector register, the consecutive elements starting from B, uh, vector length. And the, uh, the memory system will do it automatically uh, having the, using the stride. And then you do a vector add, vector register 0 plus vector register 1, store the result into vector register 2. And then vector register 2 gets shifted by 1, result is stored into vector register 3. And then you store vector register 3 starting from memory address C. And these are the latencies of the operations, basically. For example, to do the uh, addition of the first elements of vector register 0 and vector register 1, you take four cycles. But because the adder is pipelined, the next element comes back after fifth cycle 5. Right? And then you, you basically have sustained one, uh, one element per cycle in the adder. Okay. The first realization is that this is seven dynamic instructions. right? There are no branches here. That's the other realization, I guess. But it's only seven instructions you need to decode. You need to decode uh, the load only once, this load only once. So you've saved a lot of energy, actually. 304 divided by 7, assuming decode of every instruction takes the same amount of time. You reduce energy by almost 30x, actually more, 40x. The de that part of the processor, of course. So let's take a look at the basic vector code performance. So I'm going to assume no vector data forwarding. This is also called chaining in vector processor terminology. No vector chaining or data forwarding. Data forwarding means no data forwarding be between functional units in the vector, uh, vector functional units. Output of a vector functional unit cannot be used as a direct input of another. You have to populate the entire vector register. This is kind of dumb in a sense, but again, the answer is it depends, right? Is it dumb or not? Depends whether this chaining is costly. So we're going to assume that the entire vector register needs to be ready before any element of it can be used as part of another operation. Now, if you think about it, this doesn't have to be the case, right? Because one, when one element is ready, when, when one element of each of these is loaded, you can start the add, actually, of the, those elements. But we're going to assume that that's not going to be the case. You have to load all of the elements into vector register 0 and then vector register 1, and then you do the add. And this is add needs to add all of the elements, and then you start the shift. And you have to do that if you don't have data forwarding. This is like an in-order processor without data forwarding. And we're going to assume one memory port, one address generator. And, but we're going to assume 16 memory banks. And we're going to interleave with, with words. Basically, it's consecutive elements go to consecutive banks. And this is the execution time of this code, if you do this. Basically, it's in order, totally. There's no overlapping. And basically, you just add up these things. Basically, uh, let's take a look at this. The loading of vector 0 from address A. The first element you get after 11 cycles. The next element comes from the next bank. You get it in the 12th cycle over here. I guess if you add all of these up, it's really the, uh, these are the two move instructions over here. The next element you get uh, after one cycle. The next element you get after one cycle, dot, dot, dot. So you get 50 elements. Uh, you, you get the remaining 49 elements in 49 cycles. 
So if you do the calculation, this is 285 cycles. Much better than 1504. And you can do the calculation. Okay. So let's do chaining, because chaining kind of makes sense if you have the hardware resources to it. It's pretty simple. It's data forwarding from one vector function unit to another. When the first element of this becomes ready, supply it to the multiply unit. When the first element of this becomes ready, supply it to the add unit. Right. And it kind of looks like this. You have the load unit that's putting, uh, uh, load unit is actually populating a vector register, right? Uh, it's, uh, wh whenever you do a vector load, you're really populating uh, a vector length number of elements in this vector register. But when you get the first element, you not only put it into the vector register, but also supply it to the multiplier. If the multiplier actually needs it, there's, there should be a mux somewhere over here, right? So this is just an example of these particular instructions. You're really forwarding the data. That's basically what it is. And the multiplier can also forward data to the adder. And if you want to make this fully general purpose, full forwarding, all of the functional units should be able to forward data to any other functional unit, right? And then you tell muxes, of course, to control. That's why this is expensive. That's why it may make sense to look at a vector machine without chaining. But if you want high performance, you do want chaining in a vector processor. Let's take a look at the code, performance of the same code when we have vector chaining. Uh, basically, remember, we still have one memory port. This is the first load over here. And you can look at the code while I do this. Well, I guess this is the first vector load. I can exploit my hand level parallelism. This is the first vector load over here. And this is the second vector load over here. And chaining matters because you cannot par parallelize these because you have one memory port and one address generator. But once you get the results, the first elements of the second vector load, you can really start the add, right? Because now you have both the first element of vector 0 and first element of vector 1. And the first element, uh, elements of these two vectors are added after four cycles because each Add takes four cycles. Now you can start the shift. Right? And then shift takes one cycle. Unfortunately, you cannot start the store over here because you have one memory port. Because then the load is still going on. Right? But let's take a look at the execution time of this. 182 cycles. Right? It's really nice. Well, we can do better, hopefully. By Now your memory system became the bottleneck. Before, it was not necessarily the biggest bottleneck. With chaining, we went from 285 cycles to 182 cycles. But now your memory system is limiting our performance, right? Because we cannot pipe parallelize this or pipeline these because we have only one port to memory. And we cannot pipeline the load and store also, even though they're operating on independent elements. Each memory bank is a single port. So we have a memory bandwidth bottleneck. So we're going to have two load ports and one store port make the memory system more expensive. This is a real consideration. GPUs are actually memory bandwidth bottleneck today. Really, most applications are memory bandwidth bottleneck on GPUs because you don't have enough ports. But if you did have enough ports, you can actually make the execution time much faster. You can basically pipeline these loads, these two loads, because they're totally independent of each other. Right? In one port, you're getting these. In the other port, you're getting these. And then, now you're chaining. We, we, we already chained. Now you can start the store. Because while the store is going on, this load also can go on because you have one store port and two load ports. Looks great. 79 cycles. So we reduced 1504 cycles to 79 cycles. It's a little bit more expensive, of course. That's the disadvantage. But you know, on this small piece of code, it's 19x performance improvement rate. Right? It's pretty good. Now, if you're thinking why GPUs are so successful, well, this is one of the reasons. <laughs> and I'll leave the power efficiency analysis to you. That requires a lot of assumption. <laughs> OK. Any, any questions? This is great, right? So maybe we should take a break at this point, even though it's a good place. Now we're going into a little bit more uh, detail. How about we take a break for three minutes? Or do you want four minutes? Four minutes. <laughs> You guys have been very good, so 339 is better. <laughs> okay.
Okay, let's get started. I think it's already been four minutes. Okay, there are several questions. I've already asked, uh, actually, I've kind of covered the first one and one of you asked the second one, but these are important. Uh, the first one is, what if the number of data elements that you're operating on is greater than the number of elements in a vector register? Well, now it's simple. You basically loop, right? Break loops so that each iteration operates on number of elements in a vector register. Basically, each instruction, vector instruction, has to really operate on uh, the maximum number of elements in a vector register. For example, if you have 527 data elements and 64 element vector registers, you have eight iterations uh, where vector length is 64, and then you have one iteration where vector length is 15, right? which means that you need to have an instruction that changes the value of vector length when you're transitioning to the last iteration. Right? And think about the downsides of this when you're tra changing the vector length. It may introduce a stall into the pipeline because everything else is using a vector length of 64 before and other things will use a vector length of 15. But this is also called vector strip mining. Basically, you're really strip mining a large vector and chunking it into smaller vectors. I like the word chunking better. Okay, the second thing uh, is also important. What if the vector data is not stored in a strided fashion in memory? This may not be always easy to do. Uh, and if you require this, then the programmers can go crazy again, especially if the data is not laid out easily in a strided fashion. Basically, this is the same as supporting irregular memory access to a vector. Vector. How do you do that? Well, the idea is, again, relatively simple. A lot of the problems in computer engineering can be solved with a level of indirection. Basically, use a level of indirection. Indirection and locality are two very good principles. Uh, you use a level of indirection to combine or pack elements into vector registers. They're stored in very, very different locations, but pack them into a single vector register, operate them just like a vector, and after you're done with them, spread them back into their locations in memory. Basically, in other words, gather the values from wherever they are into memory, put them into a vector register, operate on them as if they were a vector, and then once you're done, scatter the values back to wherever they are. They were, or they should be in memory. These are called scatter and gather operations, and good systems should really have these. Otherwise, it's very, it's very difficult to do some operations like what I'll show you. For example, this. Is this loop vectorizable? It is really vectorizable. All right. Except memory system could be a bottleneck if you don't have gather scatter operations. So what, what's happening here is you really have an indirect access to a vector D. D is really the index vector, which specifies the indices of C that you want to load. Now this is regular. The cons uh, consecutive elements of D could, could be stored in consecutive locations, but the elements of C that you're accessing may not be in consecutive locations because D elements of D could be anything, right? So to support this, you need an uh, index load instruction, right? This is a gather instruction, in other words. This is loading uh, uh, indices in, in the D vector into the vector register. And what this is doing, this gather instruction, what it should do is it should load indirect from uh, starting with the base address RC which is the base address of C, using an index vector or a gather vector, if you will, D. And what this needs to do, this load instruction needs to do is take the base, uh, compute, the, uh, compute the locations of the different elements of the vector uh, by taking the base, adding it to the first element of the index. That's the address of the first element. Base plus uh, the first element, the second element uh, of the uh, this index vector, that's the address of the second element. Base plus the uh, third element of the index vector, that's the address of the third element. Dot, dot, dot. Make sense? So instead of assuming a stride, you're really using a vector to compute the addresses. And each element is an index from the base. Okay? 
The rest is what we've seen. So how does this work? Uh, these are often implemented in hardware to handle sparse matrix. So first of all, why does this happen? You can have a sparse matrix, right? You can have a matrix that has a million entries and only three locations or some locations can be positive and you want to operate only on the positive locations, non-zero locations. You need to uh, have these instructions that use an index vector, which is added to the base register to generate the addresses. So let's take a look at it. Let's assume this is your index vector, the, uh, and the, you have four element vectors. This is your vector D. These specify the locations you would like to store this data vector. And you need to have some base. So where do you store with that vector store operation? So you have a vector store operation that's indexed, that takes this as the index vector, and this as the data vector to store starting from a base, what the processor needs to do is to store the first element to base plus zero, right? You take the base address, you add uh, the first uh, element from the index vector to it and store uh, the data elements there. The second address you would like to store to will be base address plus two and 6.5 needs to go there. The, th uh, the third element that you store needs to go to base address plus six. And the fourth element that you store needs to go to base address plus seven. Right? Basically, you don't store to these locations if you do a vector store that's indexed. These locations you do not modify. But that's how you scatter the value. And gather is the exact opposite of this. Basically, you use the same index vector. You start with a base and you load into a vector register. Right? Does that make sense? So this makes the vector processor a lot more general purpose. Because it's not always easy to have the elements uh, be, uh, in a, uh, be apart from each other at a constant distance, right? at a constant stride. Okay, let's take a look at another way of, uh, another thing that we need to make this general purpose, we've already discussed actually, conditional operations. What if some operations should not be executed on a vector? What if they're they should be executed based on a dynamically determined condition. For example, I have this terribly written code here to fit onto the slide, which is a go-to. Don't do this. <laughs> it works. <laughs> Basically, if AI is not equal to zero, then you do this calculation. Otherwise, you don't do this calculation right, uh, for, for that element. And you keep doing this forever with this go-to. And I guess you need to have a break here. So how do you actually accomplish this? You use masked operations. And we've already seen this. You have vector mask register. It's basically a bit per each element in the vector register, determining which, uh, whether or not that element should be acted upon, should be operated upon by the instruction. So for example, for this code, you need to load A and B into vector registers. And first you need to set a mask register. And the mask register is set this way. Basically you check if vector zero is not equal to zero. What this does is basically checks whether each element is not equal to zero and sets one bit per element. That's your mask register. If, you're, if you have 64 elements in a vector register, this is 64 bits, basically. And vector multiply, this is a, assume that this is a mask multiply, or assume everything is mask. What it does is it takes into account this mask. If the mask is zero, that element is not written. If the mask is one, this operation writes this element. Make sense? Basically, it's a conditional operation. It's predicated execution, right? We've seen this before. And in fact, predicate execution was first developed for vector machines. Cray-1 had that. Because you really need this if you're operating on many data elements conditionally, right? And if you want to preserve that operation of many, many data elements with a single instruction. If you have another way of supporting it, let me know. OK, let's take a look at one more example with masking, because it's kind of nice. This is without the stupid go-to. <laughs> and this is an if-then-else. How do you do this? Uh, and this is a little bit more complicated, as you can see, because if AI is greater than or equal to BI, then you do some operation. Basically, you set CI to AI. Otherwise, you set CI to BI. How do you actually execute this with vector code? First you need to compare A and B to get some V mask, to set the vector mask. And then you do a mask store of A into the C vector. And then 
To be able to do the rest, you need to complement VMask. Right? Because some elements need to do this, and some elements need to do this. And how do you do that? By complementing VMask. So you can actually operate on these mask registers. So for example, the first uh, operation, comparing A and B, this is your VMask. And you use this VMask to do this, I guess, copy. You can think of vector copy, right? Or vector move. And you complement the VMask to be able to do the remaining operations. That's how you implement if then else. You're really operating on, these are condition registers, right? Or predicate values. You can think of these as condition registers too, right? It's really conditional execution. OK, simple, hopefully. So how do you implement this? This actually becomes interesting also, because this is actually very similar to implementation of predicated execution, too. One simple Im implementation is, basically, you execute all of the, you take all of the elements and execute all of the operations. Here, for example, you're doing, uh, I don't know, vector copy, but it could be a vector add. Let's say you're doing uh, this vector add, uh, and these are your mask, mask bits. For each element, you have a mask. You bring all of the elements in the vector, you go through the adder, and you use the mask bit as a write enable. Basically, you gate at the very end. Now, what is the disadvantage of this? Wasted work, I heard, something like that. Basically, yeah, you're wasting a lot of work, right? You're using this adder, and you're dropping things at the very last moment. You're not writing back into the register. If only one element has the mask set, then you're really wasting all your, almost all of your adder bandwidth. That's a simple implementation. The upside is simple. There's also this density time implementation. Basically, it's the fancy word for scanning the mask vector beforehand and only selecting only those things that have mask bits set. In that case, you basically execute only those operations and send it into the, send into the pipeline only those operations with mask bits set. This requires a little bit more complexity, of course, right? You need to somehow scan this. And you need to do it fast. Otherwise, it could be your critical path, or it could delay your operations. Right. But hopefully, uh, it, could, it is more power efficient. And maybe it's lo sh sh shorter latency, depending on how many things have their masks set, right? I guess you know the answer to this by now. It's, it depends. <laughs> It really depends which one is better. You can think of predicate execution the same way also, right? I'm not get into this, but one way of executing predicate instructions is executing everything and eventually writing back into the register file depending on whether the predicate is true or false. That's the simple implementation. The other way is actually waiting until the predicate values are ready. And when, the predicate, when you know the predicate value, only execute those operations that have predicate uh, equals true. Of course, this, this can add additional delay. This doesn't add additional delay. And especially with predicate instructions, to switch your mind a little bit, with predicate instructions, you don't need to wait for the predicate value data dependency, right? If that becomes ready much later, you can still execute all of this and eventually decide which one to write into the register file. OK, let's take a look at some issues. Stride and banking, I, I, I told you that we would get back to this. Oh, we have the answer. <laughs> Basically, assume that stride is not equal to one. But we would still like to be able to get one element per cycle out of the memory system. Can we do it? What should the relationship be between uh, your stride and the number of banks? Yeah. Say it again. That's right, yes. Basically, they should be relatively prime to each other. If you want to never have bank conflicts, yes? Well, if, like, if we want to be exact, we'll put on, do you just mean that the, the size of like the group mod by um, the, the, uh, the size of, OK, the number is your um, number of banks, and then you mod it by the stride. Uh -huh. And as long as the number of values in that like quotient group is larger than your latency delay. You know? OK, yeah, I think you're, you're uh, actually, you so, should probably get extra credit, too. Maybe that could be a good question. <laughs> That's right. I didn't take into account latency over here. But yes, if you really not need to take into account latency, you're right. You have, you have an equation like that. That module should be greater than your latency, right? Absolutely. 
I guess I cheated here to make it simpler. <laughs> and there are enough banks to cover the bank access latency. Right? This is still true. But this may be a little bit hard to sustain, right? So, for example, if you have uh, your if your stride is three, and if you have eight banks, I guess this works because three and eight are relatively prime, right? But if your stride is two, and if you have eight banks, this doesn't work because they're not relatively prime. You will get bank conflicts there. But now you need to take into account latency. Assume that the latency is long. Okay. So this turns out actually this is one of the big design issues in vector processors. How do you actually at least fake this, <laughs> minimize the bank conflicts? I think we'll get back to that. Now let's take. Well, I, th I think we've already covered this, but I'll uh, briefly talk about it again. Uh, you all know what's row major and column major, right? So if I ask it in the exam, you'll get it perfectly right. Okay, row major consecutive elements in a row are laid out consecutively in memory. Column major, consecutive elements in a column are laid out in consecutively in memory. And if you want to access a row versus a column, if you, let's say you're accessing rows, and then you're accessing the columns, you need to change the stride. That's what this boils down to. And this is kind of the handwritten example that I have over here, which is very similar to what we had discussed earlier uh, in this lecture. Assume that, and why, why do you need to do this? Let's say you're multiplying two matrices, right? A and B, and both of them are in row. Wow. <laughs> it's the same thing. <laughs> this time, this time you didn't have to shout. <laughs> there you go. How about, but you didn't know that, right? Okay. Actually, the other one might be better because it has color. Okay. Basically, if you're multiplying two, uh, two matrices, matrix A and matrix B, and assume that both are in row major order, uh, this is uh, matrix A. It has six elements, uh, well, six columns and four rows. Matrix B has uh, six rows and 10 columns. You'd like to form a matrix C that has four rows and 10 columns uh, to, by taking the dot product of rows and columns of A and B. That's what matrix multiplication is, right? So how do you do this? Basically, to get one element of C, you need to take a row of A and a column of B and then compute the dot product that will result in your elements, right? So you need to load A0 into vector register V1. And each time you need to increment the address by one, which means that the stride should be one here. But once you, when you're loading B0, uh, I guess the, here, B0, column zero, I'll call it, BC0 here, into a vector, and you need to load into vector register two. And each time you need to increment by 10 in that case, right? Which means that your stride is 10. If you're doing this, if you first do this and then next do this, you keep changing your stride. And depending on how many strides your machine can support, this may not be easy, right? Maybe you need to have multiple strides, right, in the machine. Or maybe you load the entire, a lot of rows of A0 into your vector registers and then a lot of rows of B0 change the stride much less often, right? Basically, different strides can lead, but, but different strides can also lead to bank conflicts, right? So you need to be careful which ones you're loading. So when you're loading A0 and when you're loading B0, if you're doing this concurrently, if you have two strides supported by your machine, they may get bank conflicts, right? And you need to be able to support this nicely. Otherwise, this kind of reduces the beauty, right? If you get a bank conflict, you're re really delaying the operation significantly. So how do you minimize these bank conflicts? And that has been the subject uh, of not only research, but implementation for a long time. Let's take a look at at least some approaches to minimize bank conflicts. But the problem is clear, right? You have different strides, and sometimes you may want to access, uh, you might want to change strides at a very fine granularity. And if you come up with a method of actually laying out data such that you can access things uh, with the same stride, let me know. That's going to be very tough. In database, actually, people have developed multiple views of data. You can you can access things in row major order. You have a row row, row layout and a column layout. 
and as long as you can, uh, you can, uh, you're doing uh, the operations at a coarse grain layer, you can switch between different layouts. But that turns out to be a little bit expensive. Okay, how do you minimize bank conflicts? Well, the first solution is more banks, right? Add a million banks, and hopefully you're not going to conflict. Expensive, right? That's the downside. Not only expensive, but you may not be able to sustain having so many banks because remember they're sharing the bus. And the electrical loading on the bus may, be, may, uh, may, uh, may not be sustainable for the clock frequency that you're running the things at. You can have better data layout to match the access pattern. That's great if you can do it, right? But what if you are switching between two different access patterns that require two different data layouts, just like row major and column major? That's not going to work well. It may not always be possible. You can have better mapping of addresses to banks. Somehow. Let's say you have a limited number of banks, but you want to minimize the conflicts. Why don't you have some function in the hardware that doesn't have direct mapping, but it kind of randomizes things? Maybe that kind of reduces the probability of conflict of two different addresses, right? You hash the address. And people have actually looked at this a lot, randomized mapping. And some of it is done in existing memory controls, actually, although not to the extent that it's really closer to relatively pseudo-random. They do XORing, for example, of different bits to determine which bank an address goes to. And this is a really nice paper, although it's very difficult to read, potentially. I'm not going to suggest that. It's, it's written by Bob Rao on pseudo-randomly interleaved memory. And it was actually developed for this exact reason. How do you minimize bank conflicts in a SIMD processor? OK. Any questions? This is a fun topic. We'll get back to banking, actually, when we talk about memory. But it's really appropriate to talk about banking in the context of uh, SIMD processors because it's, one of, it's, it's a big bottleneck. Okay, let's revisit array versus vector processors. Uh, this is really a purist distinction today. Array processors, remember, the same operation uh, happens in multiple spaces, right, at the same time. Vector processors, same ap operation happens in consecutive time steps in the same space. Most modern SIMD processors are really a combination of both. They exploit data parallelism in uh, both time and space for a given vector. Let's take a look at that. And GPUs are a prime example of this, and we'll cover in a little bit more detail. Remember this one? This is the array processor, same operation at the same time, and different operations at the same space. Yeah, different operations at the same space. Vector processor, different operations at the same time, and same operation at the same space. And this was definitely cheaper. Right? But it's probably not as powerful as this one, because as you can see, the execution of this is much shorter than the execution of this, because this goes into this time unit. Let's take a look at combining both. And I've already shown you this, but we'll, we'll look at it in a little bit more detail. This is the vector processor. You're, do, you're doing execution using one pipeline functional unit. You're doing it in uh, time. Basically, you're executing different elements at different time units. Well, if you have four functional units, you can do this. Right. This is the array processor part of it, if you will. You're executing four different data elements in different four, four different function units in space, and you're also doing things in time. Right. And now you really can sustain a lot of operations both in both space and time. Simple. Right. And how do actually existing processors do this kind of? Well, you can actually make life a little bit easier if you partition the register file. But this makes life a little bit harder to for the programmer, right? The realization of that, the registers that this functional unit can operate on are actually registers 0, 4, 8, 12. I shouldn't call them registers, elements, right? The elements of the vector registers that this functional unit operates on is restricted <laughs> to 0, 4, 8, dot, dot, dot. These, uh, the elements here, uh, that, that is operated on this function, it is restricted to 159 dot dot dot. And you can do the same thing for these. This way you can partition your register file such that each register file is now smaller, right? Or you don't have a single register file that you need to route to different functional units. Only this functional unit can access these elements. Only this functional unit can access these elements dot dot dot. Now you're making this kind of beautiful because you're not really. Not all function units can access all elements this time. As long as you can actually, uh, your, your program is like this, 
It's great, right? Okay. Is this clear? You have partition vector registers, basically. And vector registers can feed different functions. This can be an adder. This can be a multiplier, right? This is the adder that operates on element 0, 4, 8, dot, dot, dot. This is the multiplier that operates on element 0, 4, 8, dot, dot, dot. And you can have a load unit, dot, dot, dot. It's kind of a pipeline that's operating on a partition of the vector registers. Right? OK. And this is kind of the structure of a GPU today, actually. You have uh, different uh, elements in different parts of the register file like this, just applying different functional units. OK. And you can actually think of this as a vector functional unit, right? Or array functional unit, array processor functional unit. This is the terminology. This is really a lane. A lane operates on a subset of the register file. But if you look at it, the entire functional unit operates on the entire set of elements in the vector register. OK, these are simple concepts. It's just the terminology that's added over there. It's not that the terminology is not that important, but when you see the uh, na terminology lane, now you know what it is, right? It's really a functional portion of the functional units that are operating on a subset of the elements in a vector register. OK, so let's take a look at the parallelism that you can sustain with this. You can really overlap execution of multiple vector instructions. This is an example machine. It has 32 elements per vector register and eight lanes. Remember the lane, eight of these. Uh, and you can complete 24 operations per cycle while issuing one vector instruction per cycle if you have a load unit, multiply unit, and add unit in each lane. And that's what it looks like. You basically issue the load. That's the instruction issue. It completes in four cycles. And now you can have eight operations in parallel. In the next cycle, you can issue the multiply, which may, may or may not be dependent on the load. In the next cycle, you can issue that. So at the steady state, what's happening is you have 24 operations per cycle right? that's going on with eight lanes. Because each lane can now execute. It, it, it actually has three functional units, right? Load, multiply, and add. It's simple, right? Hopefully. OK, let's look, let's look at uh, this, this code. Uh, this code is very similar to what we've seen before. Uh, you can actually, this, and this is fully vectorizable, right? Vectorizable means the iterations are independent of each other. A compiler can perhaps figure this out. Right? So if you look at the scalar execution of this code, this is what happens. This is kind of the data flow graph for each iteration. What a compiler can do is, as long as it can figure out the loop iterations are independent, it can do this. It can basically take the iterations, parallelize them, and pack the instructions into vector instructions. Now this load is operating on element 0. This load is operating on element 1. This load is operating on element 2, dot, dot, dot. This is really iteration 1, iteration 2, and they're all happening in parallel. Basically, vectorization is a compile time reordering of operation sequencing. We'll talk about static instruction scheduling. You can do it that way. But once you do static instruction scheduling, you can schedule these loads at the same time. But you can also combine these loads into a single vector instruction, right? Because they're really operating on different data elements. Now, we've got to be a little bit careful here. Here, the memory axis is relatively regular, right? If the memory axis is regular, now you can combine them. But let's assume that the memory axis was irregular. Now the compiler needs to somehow pack the operations, right? And it needs to ensure that, remember the lanes? Assume that this is executing in one lane and this is executing in another lane. It needs to do the register allocation such that registers are allocated from this lane's register file to this part of the program, to this load. Right? It's really, you have a vector operation, but it's really executed in different lanes, OK? But this requires extensive loop dependence analysis. What does this mean? Well, you somehow need to figure out whether the different loop iterations are dependent or independent of each other. If this, for example, if one of this was an i minus 1 or i plus 1, it wouldn't work, right? If you're adding a value that's being written by the next iteration or the previous iteration, it won't work. Or i minus 1 actually works better here, I guess. OK, is this clear? So keep this picture in mind. We're going to look at this when we get back to GPUs. Because what GPUs do is actually, you don't do this at compile time. At compile time, actually, it turns out this is very difficult to do. 
uh, unless you really have no dependencies in the code. Once you start having dependencies, automatically vectorizing things become very difficult. People have looked at this for decades and decades and decades. In fact, predication was developed to enable automatic code vectorization when you have a loop with an if then else condition. But let's assume that you're a programmer and you have this structure. Now what can happen is this is a thread, right? You can say that this is a thread. The thread is executing this iteration, and each iteration is a thread. And you have many threads. One thread executing this iteration, another thread executing this iteration, another thread executing this iteration. And those threads are all doing the same thing, really. So you can program using this thread construct. Each iteration is really a thread, and threads can get mapped to a SIMD hardware. You don't need to have SIMD instructions. You still have threads. But the hardware dynamically groups the same instruction of different threads to a kind of a SIMD instruction. That's what GPUs do today. Alternatively, you can do it as a SIMD instruction if you have a SIMD machine. Basically, SIMD machine is a vector load. You generate a vector load. GPUs don't do that. You don't have a vector load. You have a thread. And threads are doing exactly the same thing. And when they execute the same instruction, they, they're grouped together. A group of threads that are doing exactly executing exactly the same instructions are called a warp. OK, we'll get back to this. So let me summarize and then give you another example from real machines, and then we'll conclude today. So vector or SIMD machines are good at exploiting regular data level parallelism. Hopefully, that's clear by now. Same operation performed on many data elements. This improves performance and simplifies the design. Right? It's beautiful. No intervector dependencies. The problem is performance improvement is limited by the vectorizability of code. If your code doesn't look like this, if it looks ugly, if you have an I minus 1 here, good luck. Good luck on a vector machine, at least. In a data flow machine, it's great. <laughs> the scalar operations limit vector performance. Dependencies also limit ve vector machine performance. And actually, scalar operations. Let's take a look at scalar operations. Remember MDAL's law. Right. MDAL's law says the part that you cannot really parallelize bottlenecks your performance. If 1% of your code is scalar, 99% of your code is vector, and if you have infinite number of elements, the maximum speed up you can get is 100. Right. Because of this, Cray-1 actually was the fastest scalar machine at its time. They designed that scalar unit to be the fastest possible because you had this bottleneck. You're really bottlenecked by the scalar part of your code. So Cray designers were very smart. If they want to design a supercomputer, they said, oh, we're bottlenecked by this part, so we're going to optimize it, such that it's not going to limit our uh, parallel performance. We can design a machine with a parallel part that's really good. There's no question about that. But once we do that, and the compilers are uh, parallelizing code at, let's say, I don't know, 75% level, your maximum speed up is 4x. 75% of your code is vectorizable. In that case, your maximum speed up is just 4x, regardless of however many units you put in your parallel part. So that's why they designed this machine to uh, be, have the fastest frequency and uh, fastest scalar operation at its time. So let's take a look in the last few minutes uh, of, uh, to many existing ISAs and how they were actually impacted by vector processing. Not GPUs, but general purpose processors. Many ISAs actually include vector-like operations. Have you used these? Yes? Who has used, I don't know, Intel, Intel AVX, I guess, whatever they call it now? OK, that's good. Is it easy to use? That's good. I guess it's easy for some, hard for some others. <laughs> I guess it depends is the right answer. <laughs> I'll give you an example for those who haven't used these, certainly. Um, I'll give you an example from the first thing, uh, first one of these that actually uh, became very popular. And it's the Intel Pentium MMX operations. Intel has advanced this. But all, 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 all manufacturers have these now. And I'm, I'm sure I'm missing some names because Intel keeps changing their names, for example, for some reason. I don't know what it is, but <laughs> I guess it's a, it's a, it's a nicer name <laughs> in every generation. So the idea is to augment a scalar ISA with some vector operations. And uh, how do you actually do this in a simple way without actually really adding vector instructions? Uh, 
for Intel Pentium MMX at least, one instruction can operate on multiple data elements simultaneously. These are called MML, MMX instructions, multimedia extensions. Uh, similar to array processing, yet it's much, much, much more limited. And this is designed with multimedia or graphics operations in mind, and I'll show you an example from a nice paper. So this is one example. This is the paper that talks about it and uh, MX technology extension, the Intel architecture. Uh, basically, you can treat a register, an MMX register, a floating point register or integer register, doesn't matter actually, uh, in four different ways. You can think of this as a single scalar value that contains a 64-bit quad word, two elements that contain 32-bit double words, four elements that contain 16-bit words, or eight elements that contain 8-bit bytes. Right? Same data, you can interpret it in different ways. And you can have an instruction that operates on these eight bytes. So you can add a pack, uh, you can add a, this is called a packed operation. You can do a packed add by treating this register as eight eight bit bytes. And the opcode determines the data type. And no vector length register. There is no vector. It's not a vector machine really. It's just treating the data as multiple different data elements and you're doing the same operation on those data elements. Relatively limited. Well, I guess stride is always equal to one in this case. I don't know about the newer versions. Don't quote me. Okay, so one example of the power of this. Uh, let's assume we're overlaying this human image one on top of the background and image two. And assume that these are all the same sizes. It's called chroma keying. Basically, what we would like to do is to form a bit mask of this image first. Assume that this background is blue. You cannot see it, but it's blue. And this lady is not wearing anything blue. <laughs> that's, that's a good assumption for now. Uh, you can develop image processing techniques that can get rid of those assumptions probably, but let's not go into that now. Uh, basically, what we would like to do is we'd like to form a bit mask of this. And uh, for this bit mask, the blue parts should have a value of true and not blue parts should have a value of false. And we're going to use this bit mask to merge these two images. For the parts that have a value of true, the final image will get uh, the pixels from this image. For the parts that have a, a bit mask value of false, the final image that we're going to form will get the pixels from this image. Make sense? It's basically a simple if then else, really, based on this bit mask. So the first thing is how do you actually form this bit mask using multiple uh, by, by looking at multiple pixels. One way of doing this is actually a huge for loop where every instruction looks at a single pixel that's of 8 bits values, right? But if you have an instruction that is terribly named like this, packed, compare, equal, byte, <laughs> it's actually not that terrible, right, once you understand it. What you need to, this instruction operates on 8 bits at a time. What you can do is you can load 8 bits over here, which is this, MM3, and you can compare it to 8 bits that are all set to blue, which is the pixel code for blue, right? You compare these two registers and store the result into MM1 because x86 is a two address machine. Uh, what this does is basically it checks whether this 8 bit is equal to this, this 8 bit is equal to this, this 8 bit is equal to this, dot, 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 in parallel. Now we can compare eight of these pixels in parallel, check whether they're equal to blue. And this basically says whether they're blue or not. And this is the result, basically. This is blue, this is blue, this is blue, this is blue. So as a result, you get this bit mask that looks like this. So MM1 now contains a bit mask. Make sense? Basically, what we've done is we formed the bit mask by using a packed operation that can do eight operations with a single instruction instead of doing it with a single instruction that operates on single data. This is really SIMD. Single instruction, multiple data, right? Exactly. Maybe it's not very, very programmable. Simply. So once you have the bit mask, this is your bit mask. Uh, this is the same bit mask over here. Uh, what you need to do is, uh, and this is kind of the loop that you need to do. You load eight pixels from uh, the woman's image. That goes into MM3. You load eight pixels from the, apparently that was a blossom image, into MM4. You do this bit masking. You basically check 
what is blue in the first uh, in the first image, and to form the final image, which will go into MM4, this multimedia register four, you basically do a packed end of MM1. MM1 is the bit mask. MM4 is the uh, original, uh, actually the, the blossom image. Remember, we're overlaying laying the woman's image on top of the blo blossom image. Basically, what this packed end does is it ends uh, this bit mask with the final image. Right. And remember, the bit mask actually takes the blue parts, right? I hope. What, we're, what we were trying to do is, for the blue parts in the original image, we want uh, the result to be uh, to come from the second image. So we actually get the pixel values from the second image in those portions where the bit mask is set to 1. And the bit mask was set to 1 based on comparing uh, the pixels uh, to blue in this image. Okay, so we get the right values from the second image. Now we need to actually get the right values from the first image, and that's a packed and not, basically, right? So you take the pixel from the first image and do the packed and not and store it into MM1. What this does is this gets the portions that you would like from woman's image that are not blue. Okay? And it's a packed and not, which means that you really complement this uh, bit mask. So you can think of it and you can, re you can read the paper also. Eventually, MM1 stores the things that you want the pixels that you want uh, from the first image. MM4 stores the pixels that you want from the second image, and you more merge them using a packed OR. And that's the pixel that you want. Okay? And you do this for every eight pixels in the images. So it's pretty powerful. It reduces your work by 8x. Right. You could do this with scalar instructions, except you would need to do each pixel one by one. So you can read this paper. This is actually a really nice paper. Uh, and this is just one example from the paper that talks about the design choices for MMX. OK, it's a good place to stop. We'll talk about graphics processing units. Or another way of thinking of this is really SIMD, where SIMD is really not exposed, at least as much, to the programmer.